Welcome, welcome, welcome to Misfit Athletics podcast episode number 15. Training camp at CrossFit Little Rock, August 21st to the 23rd. You can sign up at misfitathletics.com. We are also having a camp in, I can't, I can't say it, um, just outside of Reykjavik, Iceland, September 18th through the 20th. That'll Seth, work. Seth, you want to tell them what? No? No, I'm not even going to attempt it's, it. It's something like Gargofarge, we think. We looked it up on YouTube. Um, I started giggling for, for about 10 minutes. Arnie, you'll have to help me out with yeah, that. Yeah, we need help with that, Arnie. Um, so we're going to Iceland. Pretty exciting first uh, international trip for us. So um, if you're <laughs> in the area or uh, <laughs> want to take a $99 WOW Airlines flight from Boston to New York to join us in magical Iceland, you should do it. It'd be a vacation and a training experience. So I think people should. We are still running for anybody new. We're still running the Win Misfit Gear contest on Instagram. Uh, we might start bouncing around between Instagram and Facebook. So keep your eye out for that. Uh, for now, it's just hashtag Win Misfit Gear. Um, show us what you're up to, and you enter yourself into the contest. Yeah. So I guess we'll just uh, jump right into um, what Cycle One is going to look like, what we expect from you guys, um, and. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll just keep it pretty simple to, to answer a lot of questions that have been coming in um, fairly rapidly. So uh, first things first, the conditioning is going to be um, knocked back down from like your standard CrossFit every day back down to kind of raw monostructural bitch work. So cycle one every year is always about kind of resetting the athlete. So um, breaking things back down to the basics, whether it's your lifts, uh, your gymnastic skill, whatever it is, it's going to be very basic. It's going to allow for that... Um, high intensity and it's going to allow you guys to kind of rebuild skills so if you do have some bad habits that you just kind of trained through and did your, did the best you could with uh through last season hopefully we can clean them up at this point of the year so um a lot of bitch work this cycle you're going to see a lot of rowing running biking repeats um i'm going to get the question every day uh what do i do if i don't have a bike well the answer is go get a bike the next answer is figure out something that is similar to monostructural that you have a major weakness in and continue to work that. So if you have a problem with burpees and it's bike repeats, don't just jump on the rower every week and say, oh, I'm rowing instead of biking. Continue to mix it up, vary it a little more than um, you might normally uh, later on in the year, um, but just make sure that you're really pushing that aerobic threshold, really trying to get that uh, raw conditioning going down. Do you have any other suggestions for people that are going to keep asking about what do I do if I don't have a bike? Um, it, it's, it's tough because we're not, we, we've said this maybe a dozen times now, we're not going to give you guys, uh, some magic ratio because it's something that we adamantly want in the program. Right. I mean, we put it in the warm up, we put it in conditioning pieces, we put it in monostructural work. It's part of what we do. It's part of what makes our athletes learn how to push and met cons where they feel like their legs are going to fall off. Um, so get yourself a bike, even if you end up getting a junker from Craigslist and that's your beginning. Right. Um, you know, we've said before, maybe add a few calories, maybe don't. Um, as long as you're working hard on the bike in a similar time domain, you're going to get what we're looking for. And if you look on the site and you see that you're way off on the times, maybe that's when you start to get an idea of when you should scale up a little bit. And if you're really not going to get a bike, like it's not in your budget, your gym owner's not going to get one, whatever it is, if you're just not going to get a bike, but you want to continue to follow, just keep switching up that stuff. So uh, extra running one week, extra rowing another week. Maybe it's a big set of burpees one week. Maybe it's interval work with burpees. Uh, maybe it's double unders. Whatever it is, find something else that you can do that fits the time domain and uh, go as hard as you can with that. But um, to keep answering every day, what do I do instead of biking? Uh, most of you guys are going to be kind of on your own taking this little bit of advice and running with it. So I hope uh, I hope you guys can figure something out. And again, always go to your weaknesses. If you have a major weakness, that's that's what you should be addressing anyway. So um, yeah, just just head there and, and think about something. You'll you'll come up with something easy. Um, so again, biking, running, rowing. Uh, that's going to be the bitch work. We will have uh, traditional CrossFit Metcons uh, posted. Five days a week or four days a week? Yeah, five, five days, days a, week. a week. Yeah, and the uh, one of the mandatory ones will be a super long piece every week. So anywhere from probably the short end will be around 25 minutes. The long end, 45, maybe 50 minutes, depending on what it is. Like the test uh, is EVA. So depending on where you're at, if you're 
not quite regionals level. I mean, I know it's a benchmark, but that's the sort of workout that people should realistically be scaling way back. It's it's a really long, crazy workout. It's heavy, even though it's a kettlebell, and 150 pull-ups for your average affiliate goer is significant, and it can impact the rest of your week's training if you're not scaling it back. Now, I'm not telling you to scale it back. What I'm saying is these long pieces are, are going to be out there. They're going to be intense, and we don't want to see people going 75, 80 minutes on a, a workout. So if you've got five rounds for time or something coming up, and it's just ridiculous runs and big sets of a bar or whatever it is, scale it back. Try to find that time domain that's going to be between that 25, 45 minutes um, and make sure that you're sticking with the, the group with all the comments. And now that we have 300 comments a day on the blog, you should be able to figure out if you are with everybody or not. Um, anything to add to that? No, I just want to echo the the scaling down on the long ones i mean there were some people last year going 70 80 minutes on on workouts and that's starting to push outside of the time domain that you're going to see in crossfit yeah and long and slow does translate back but slow and crossfit is a very relative term it's not the same as slow and running it's not the same as slow and biking or rowing so um, like we consider the misfit try pretty close to a long piece and that's for most people, 20, 20 for the, the best male athletes to, you know, just under 30 for some of the right. females. And that's a long piece. So if you're dancing around 45 minutes on that, you're you're in trouble. That's not what it's intended to do. So you'll see a lot of stuff uh, along those lines. So we know that we know that a lot of the days people are going to have choices between um, accessory work or a Metcon. Right. When do you do the Metcon? Uh, so, as a luckily for cycle one, everyone, like I said, starting over. If your weakness is conditioning, and you should know based on last year's results how you know what your weaknesses are. If your weakness is conditioning more so than strength, you're a bigger guy. It's time to do the Metcon. If you are a smaller athlete or just a weaker athlete in general, I think the accessory pieces will benefit you greater through the season with complementing the strength that's written and that's what that's kind of where i draw the line now i don't think that every day if it's optional whenever it's optional you should always go with the accessory or always go with the metcon but depending on your weakness you should favor one or the other um that's how i would do it yeah and the lifts the lifts go with the accessory so if you consider yourself um you know to be struggling in x lift and you really kind of look at the Metcon and say, you know, I could probably cr- cr- crush this, cruise through it, whatever, you might pick the accessory. You're also not going to be as beat up by doing the monostructural lift and accessory. Right. And you're allowing yourself to grow a little bit. So if you're one of the smaller guys that really cruises through that stuff, maybe two or three days a week, um, you bite the bullet and do the accessory work. And, you know, maybe make sure you get some cool down work in and still spend your, you know, time in the gym getting better. But you, you have to give yourself a better chance to recover every day. I totally agree with that. Um, the Metcons are still going to be CrossFit. And, um, I mean, depending on what it is, it, it can beat you up pretty good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there'll be a lot of shorter pieces, too. The, the days that the, the Metcon's not mandatory, you'll find some of the shorter sprint pieces. And those are things you'll be deciding on between that and accessories. So, um, I guess we're going to warm-ups now. People had a lot of questions about the warm-ups. They are getting a little more extensive this year. Um, I took a lot of time um, writing warm-ups for Travis, Jordan, and our games teams uh, this year just because I knew that last year we, we really went over the top with Jordan and we really kind of just expected him to be able to handle all this volume without really prepping him for it as well as we should have. And so this year we took a lot of time to... Um, figure out kind of what kind of, again, these are sort of like accessories in warm-ups, but what kind of accessory movements would be good movement prep for the day at hand. So, like, I'm a big fan of um, activating the glutes if you're going to do back squats. So we went over some uh, banded glute activation where you just kind of put a band between your ankles or between your knees, or not between, but around the outside, and they kind of open the legs closed, and they move till they feel the outside of their hips start lighting up for about two, three minutes. Then you add some hip extensions, you add some GHRs, whatever it is, that starts to get that posterior chain turned on um, for squatting. So we add that before you start to spike or before you do a little more just to kind of prep the muscles and kind of uh, stimulate the areas that you're really trying to use and create a lot of power from. So that worked really well for um, 
the athletes we tried it on, they were all really happy with that. They all felt better when they were lifting. So we're going to try it in cycle one and see if people um, respond well to it or not. And considering Drew's going to talk about the, the strength volume here in a minute, but considering the amount you guys will be squatting this cycle, I think it'll be uh, hugely beneficial to make sure that you don't just skip over that every day. Um, you'll also find uh, after you do your kind of movement prep piece that you'll have still some sort of like a primer, not really a primer, but just something to get your heart rate up a little bit, get moving around. And it'll typically have one gymnastic skill, something really basic that you can make sure that you're doing correctly, efficiently, whatever, with a basic monostructural or a simple movement like a wall ball, box jump, box step up, whatever it is. And we'll put those back and forth together. You don't necessarily have to go 100% and try to kill it like a workout. You just go through the movement you know, at a decent pace. Just get your heart rate up and make sure everything's feeling good. It's that simple. It's a warm-up. It's not a workout. So don't race your body through it. It's not intended for that. It's just intended to kind of stimulate you and get you ready for the day. Thoughts? Um, just a, a mentality to try to have with the accessory work. I think... Um, you know, high-level CrossFitters in general have incredibly strong hips, glutes, midlines, all these different things. But because we go so fast, not a lot of them are fantastic at activating those muscles um, to be able to actually use in the exercise. So I don't think that the accessory work for a lot of people is going to be something that's going to make them significantly stronger. It's really really good for teaching you how to use your muscles so when you're doing good mornings when you're doing glute ham raises and ghd sit-ups think about firing certain muscle groups to be able to move you through that and then realize how to fire them while you're back squatting um, and you'll notice a really big difference when you can use i'm actually going to talk about it a little bit more with some of the other movements but when you can use other muscles um, instead of just in a back squat putting a bar on your back dropping to the bottom standing back up yeah, and um, I think a lot of people could still benefit from practicing just the simple simple hip hinge. I think that's overlooked, and people just squat back because they're told to push their butt back, but they don't actually know what they're doing necessarily. Right. So a lot of those um, accessory pieces in the warm-up will just kind of reinforce those good habits of hip hinging and when to bend the knee and all that good stuff. So I think it'll just kind of reinforce some good habits for you guys as well. Um what am I missing? We did our Metcon accessory bitch work warm up. I think it's up for you now. So uh, the Oli and the uh, strength stuff. Cool. Um, very straightforward. Very um, power lifting with some Olympic lifting skill work. So what I want to do in this podcast, and and I'll probably end up posting the link to this almost every day, um, is just talk about some things to think about in each lift. Um, the back squat. I know that. The last cycle, when we got rid of the um, we got rid of the shoes and belts and knee sleeves and dropped the percentages down a little bit and asked people to learn how to squat. Um, some people took us seriously, and some people just assumed it was another squat cycle. Um, the problem with the way I perceive through Facebook and Instagram people squatting is it looks one way in a Metcon, it looks another way in percentage work and it looks another way in one rep max work. Um, the cycle that we're about to do is a volume cycle. It's, uh, it's a lot of reps. Um, you do have a day in between squatting this year, but it's, it is very similar to last year. If you squat with great form and you move the weight as fast as you can on the way up, you're going to get stronger, fairly plain and simple. If you're the type of person that struggles with um, you know, volume of squatting or volume of leg stuff in an actual Metcon, you're going to benefit a lot from this. If you struggle with one rep maxes because you're not necessarily as powerful or not necessarily as used to it, you have to squat fast in this cycle. Um, if you don't, you're probably going to like cycle two a little bit more. Cycle two is a little bit more about explosive power. Um, but just really think about the way that you move. Maybe you know, film yourself and say, is my 70% squat look like my 90% squat? Maybe just a little bit slower. Um, next up would be strict press. Uh, very scary videos of some strict <laughs> press online. And we're not power lifters. Um, so we need to make sure that there's skill transfer. So a strict press needs to have a similar bar path and a similar, um, you know, body pattern as a push press or a push jerk. 
if you lean back and bench press a push press, you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> right. And if you lean back and push and do that with a push jerk, you're really, really going to hurt yourself. Um, one thing that's really cool that people don't necessarily know about the strict press is when you can use the connective tissue throughout your entire body, you can strict press about 10% more. So I'd see people pull the bar out of the rack, everything else in their body's limp, they press the bar up or they don't press the bar up and they wonder what's going on. Um, we are going to be strict pressing three times a week and this comes from kind of the old Russian mentality of if you want to press, you have to press. So if you look back at the way that they do it, the coaches talk about literally squeezing your quads, calves, butt, gut, upper back, pecs, squeezing the bar like you're trying to pop the bar and using the contractile or using the um, connective tissue throughout your entire body because you're everything's connected to actually press the bar. So especially on this, it's, it's tough to do on a one rep max, but it does transfer. It's really easy to do like day one next week, five by five at 70% perfect time to pull the bar out of the rack, go through your checklist, squeeze everything, then press and see how it goes. Um, so one of five by five, I mean, I've seen plenty of videos with people that they'll press up overhead, they'll come down here and they'll relax, rest, deep breath and press again. So, I mean, for me personally, I've found that coming right back down and using almost that reflex at the bottom to start pressing back up would be something that helps me being a weaker presser. What do you think about something like that for people? Without sacrificing, obviously. Um, I would just want to make sure I know people that come down and hit themselves and it causes a millimeter of a knee or a hip hinge or things right. change. If you can come back down in a controlled fashion, um, go for it. It's one of those things that's sort of like, um, like, should you do a dynamic start in the Olympic lifts? Right. Most people don't have the skill to do it. If you do, hell yeah. I mean, more right. speed on the bar is more speed on the bar. Yep. Um, so just something to think about. Um, when you watch your videos of your own presses, you shouldn't see much movement in your body. Everything should be pretty tight and really important that you keep that neutral neck so that it transfers next cycle into the push press. Um, you guys have already done the power position pause snatch. Um, you're going to be doing it in sets through the cycle, through the first few weeks, and then we'll move down to the low hang with some pause work. Um, we asked that nobody throw their torso out over <laughs> the bar and then move back and forth like this and then throw the bar up. And it's just too much fun to put your video on Instagram right. to get more weight. Um, please read the article and watch the video. People are like, well, should I do it this way or should I do it like the video? You should probably do it like the video. We talked about Arnie earlier in this, trying to speak his town, you know, in Icelandic. Ger or whatever. Ger yeah. But he, we also posted a video of Arnie on the blog last night, and he makes that look almost effortless, and it's exactly what you want to see, especially those first two. If you guys haven't checked it out, he you see him just get to power position, and just extend and then sit right down under the bar. And, and yep. it doesn't look like that windshield wiper that we saw all over Instagram yesterday. So yeah. um, if it's not looking like that in your own videos, then you need to really you know back the weight down and make it look the way it's supposed to look before you step it back up. Right. It's not a real max if you're not doing it right. So. No. And to be honest, I mean, who cares what your power position pause snatch max is? Right. It doesn't really matter. Um, one really cool thing with Arnie's videos, if you, you're watching it directly from the side, so you can stare just at the end of the barbell and yep. see where the path goes. Yes. Does it go out? Does it sweep back into his hip? Because if you did this right, the bar and power position should be a little out in front and then still sweep back up through. That's how you know you're doing it right. There's a nice app that you can download that'll actually yep. map your bar too. So, What's it called? Iron Path. Iron Path. We're not making money off them, but we'll use it. Next uh, Olympic lift is the pause power position clean. Um, don't really need to go over that. You guys get the idea of what we're trying to do here, I assume. Um, you will be met. I'm not sure when this is going to be posted. You will either already have been <laughs> done it or you're going to be doing it real soon. Um, same exact idea. We are going to be getting some split jerk in there. Obviously, it's going to be at lighter weight. Um, gives you a fantastic opportunity to work on your split jerk. There's no reason for it not to be perfect um, at 70% of your power position pause clean. Right. So, um, 
Deadlift. Uh, we will be doing some deadlift. We've talked so much about it. For anybody that um, is new to the website, head to our YouTube channel, which you're probably at right now if you're watching this, um, and look back at some of the day at HQs or any of the other videos that we have. We've got a bunch of deadlift stuff on there. Uh, really important not to um, let your ego get into the equation in the deadlift because you pay for it literally for the rest of your life. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, this this is this movement um, is going to make you better at back squatting. It's going to make you better at pulling from the floor and all of your Olympic lifts. So um, try to think about it as a skill a little bit more than just squeeze the bar and rip it off the floor. But um, that Instagram, though. I know it. I know. There isn't really much to be said about bench press other than uh, what we say every time it comes back up. Be safe. You know, get your mobility in. Pe pec tears are people get internally rotated from, from sitting at their desk and then they throw 275 pounds on a bench and their chest pops. So. We could probably either shoot a quick video or post a video of some good examples of bench because exactly you're exactly right. People, you know, they don't warm up well and then they go wide grip and then they try to press the bar, right? So It's actually no bounce, too. You're not, not going to be bouncing in this cycle. What? So no oh. the no bounce bench oh press. <laughs> um, and again, like, the bench press will complement the strict press in, in a lot of ways. And so... Talking about the wide grip, Drew jokes about that, but that's not anything that's going to help you strict press or get strong. It's not going to help really anything. So the the grip on the bench is going to be um, sort of, would you say, like thumb width from the uh, knurling? That's about where I line up. I myself. usually write press grip bench right on that, there. So it's the same for me. Yeah, yep. so it, it is my press grip. So, yeah, so it's about the same width. So don't, don't go super wide. This isn't a powerlifting meet. No, and, and to be honest, we do it because we do so much pressing. It's really helpful for the shoulder to be back in the socket while you're doing a lot of pressing. So, you know, things like, you know, push-ups and bench press help your shoulder. It's not necessarily that we think you need to have a big bench press because the people who have it right. still, who had it before CrossFit still have it, and the people who didn't, eh, they might be a little bit better, but it's not really a huge part of our sport. Um, one last thing for those of you um, that, that don't, Remember the rest, pause, strict press. We do this with dumbbells. Uh, you basically do a set. Um, what is it? 15 breaths, something like that. You do a max set. Yeah, 12 to 15 breaths. 12 like to that. 15 breaths. I think the breaths go down, right? The rest goes down to the breaths go down. That's how we've done it in the past. Something like that. So you, you basically do a set, take a short rest, do another max set, take a short rest, do a third max set. Um, this is really, really hard for people to do properly. So we're going for a neutral grip with the press. Um, so obviously, normally we're here. We're going to be here with the dumbbells. Um, and people lean back and turn their hand and press. And really important to get the pressing into a different plane, um, again, for health of the shoulder and then just for strength. So it, if you start doing this, just think about it as it doesn't count. It's no different than, um, you know, doing a hip hop for like a push press or anything like that. So. What's the type of what's the name for that bar we have that has the neutral grip in the it? The football bar. Yeah, the football bar. So if you guys are having trouble with a dumbbell and your shoulder just will not cooperate in the neutral grip, you may or may not have a football bar. But if you do, it's kind of a cool way to it, it'll force you to stay in a neutral grip for both bench and press. So it's kind of something cool to play with, and, and it forces you to kind of have a better movement pattern for that press. So Absolutely. if you have one, you can play with it in warm ups and stuff. So. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, that's 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 the gist of what we're going to be doing. We're going to be squatting three times a week. We're going to be pressing three times a week. Um, it's you know, this cycle is so much of it is just back to basics. And when you go back to basics, you should really think about the way that you move. I mean, we should, anyways. Anybody that's been to a camp, we say it over right. and over and over and over. Think about the way that you move. Um, Ben Smith won the games because he's the best mover at the games. Yeah, he did. He did. We've been for two years now straight. We've been talking about, well, we've been talking about him for a long time, but for two years straight, we've been bringing him up at camp. Every camp. Every single camp that we've done, we talk about Ben because, um, you know, even just seeing him in the warm-up area with an empty bar is just a pretty incredible thing to see. And surprise, surprise, through a long variety of tests, his great movement patterns set him on top. Um, yep. I think that's about it. We got All some right. questions. Yeah, a couple we? more questions. We'll We're going to start getting some Q&A. Whoa. We're going to start trying to get some Q&A into all these podcasts. So keep your eye on Facebook and Instagram. And when we're getting ready to do one, we'll throw it up there. So here's a kind of a specific question, but I'll address it. 
Um, if he's thinking about it, others might be as well. Um, will the trend of deadlifts and muscle ups on the same day continue? And what is the reason behind it? And second part is why do we rarely do bar muscle ups? Um, so the, the muscle They're up, easy. yeah, yeah, you should be able to do them. Um, the muscle up and deadlift combination isn't necessarily on purpose. It's just the way kind of all the pieces fit together in the best way that I can shape them. Uh, the accessory stuff, um, will alternate probably week to week between on one day in particular, a push up or a strict muscle up. And that won't necessarily coincide with the deadlift. Those days of accessory work will shift around a little bit. Some of the accessory work will stay planted because it complements the lifts, as we talked about earlier. Um, but some of it uh, has the ability to move around a little bit. So we might see some movement there. And yeah, the bar muscle up thing, it's just uh, it's a it's a skill. It's not something that we need to spend a lot of time on. As the open or regionals gets closer, I think uh, I think we'd probably, I think I'd probably put them in the Metcons a little more. I, I know we saw them a whole lot last year leading up into regionals, and actually people are asking me, why do you do bar muscle ups so much instead of ring muscle ups? So I can't really win, um, but you'll practice both, and if you see bar muscle ups, they'll be in, um, in Metcons, but just not something that we're overly concerned about seeing in the open. And the people that go to regionals, they're not really an issue for them. So again, this program is aimed at regionals athletes and if you need that extra work in that um you can find time to do it on a rest day you can practice that skill um on lower volume or you know get some help with them so that's one question Let's see what else we got talked about the warm-ups uh okay our ropes have been taken down temporarily what is a good substitution scaling option for rope climbs so it's another question kind of like the bikes it's i'm not going to give you much of a different answer find a rope. If you don't have a rope, there's no real way that I can think of to simulate how to place your feet on a rope, pull your knees to your chest, and stand up on a rope. The rope climb is a skill. It's a test of grip and a test of skill. Um, that's about it. And it's kind of a conditioning piece. So if it's it was... one of the easiest things to... I mean, if you got like a tree... To hang a rope, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean... Get a rope. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like they have a rope, but it's been taken down in the gym. Okay. So for the time being... Um, Again, this cycle would be a great time to work on strict pull-ups, which you're going to do, weighted strict pull-ups. You can just kind of sprinkle those back in, um, sub something out. I mean, I've seen towel pull-ups done where you hang a towel around a pull-up bar, forces you to have kind of that closer grip, and then pulling that way. So Is that really it. Metcon worthy, though? No, nope, it's not. It's really not. Um, but and you feel silly. You kind of feel like... Um like Richard Simmons, because you're like jumping and doing the like. It's kind of a dance. <laughs> it's a, it, so yeah, if you want to do that, you might want to do it like at home, like around the shower pole. I would say, and I would even uh, uh, the shower pole. Yeah, uh, curtain rod. Oh, okay. I was you like, what do you have in your rod. shower? <laughs> you guys don't have shower pole. Shower pole. <laughs> no. Shit. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can do it around your curtain rod, I guess. Cargo farsh. Um, or just substitute pull-ups for now. So if it takes you 15 seconds to get up the rope, maybe you do seven kipping pull-ups. And it's kind of similar, using your hips, doing some pulling work, whatever. If your ropes are temporarily taken down, they'll be back up. And when they get back up, make sure you still have the skill. It's not something we are going to be overly concerned with. Got a question over there? I got nothing. What? I got nothing. There, there was the only, thing on, the only one on Facebook was... Um, Jordan Cook or Joe Silvestri won an arm wrestling match. Um, no comment. Yeah. It's too soon. Okay, I, I got a decent one. Any recommendation for Masters athletes following the programming this year? To scale or not to scale? That is the question. Um, so Masters could mean 40 to 44, 45 to 49, 50 to 54. 78 years old, right? Um, 38, looking to go masters, that kind of thing. Uh, we talk about it all the time. We answer this question almost the same way every single time in the comments section. Prioritize intensity. Um, listen to your body. If you're the type of person that's a masters athlete that is trying to go to the CrossFit Games and wants to do really well at the CrossFit Games, uh, you, you might need to work into a little bit extra volume. But if you keep waking up in the morning feeling like crap and not able to push um, it's going to be an issue. So I would say start lower volume, um, start scaled, and as the year goes on, try to add a little bit extra and see what happens. But I wouldn't start with too much volume um, and get no results. 
Yeah, that sounds right. And obviously, you're always uh, triaging your needs, uh, especially as a Masters athlete. We're going to assume that, that the full amount of volume for most is probably not reasonable. Um, there are some. I bet Jeff Goebel, like does the whole blog and then some. The guy's a freak. So um, shout out to Jeff. Good job this year. Uh, but in general, um, if your if your weakness clearly from watching the games this year or participating in the Open is strength, you're going to prioritize that strength. You're going to hit those accessories. If your Metcon or gymnastic skill was really suffering, you know you'll pri- prioritize that. And you may only be hitting two pieces a day. You might not be hitting four. You might hit three. You might need to take you know an additional rest day because you're just getting too beat up and not recovering as fast as the people we're writing this for. So whatever it is, you, you're going to have to find a way to modify it. Um, and if it's not working for you and you're, you're still, you know, set on following it, send us an application for remote coaching. I mean, that's, that's the other option. So, yeah. And, and, and one thing, one thing else to say is, is just being able to get below parallel with an overhead squat and just being able to get muscle ups, um, or handstand pushups as a master is huge. So maybe you do the strength and the Metcon, you know, sort of like an affiliate and then, you know, really hammer down on mobility and skill work because you set yourself apart as a master's athlete with mobility and skill work. I mean, Absolutely. I guess you could say every athlete does, but it's, you know, there's a huge magnifying glass on it. And, you know, we know plenty of athletes that if they could, you know, do certain things, you know, double unders, you know, um, overhead squat, get their shoulders in certain positions, they would, you know, crush all of the stuff, but they can't get there. So. Right. Yeah, we know plenty of, of masters that have the capacity, but like you said, the movements aren't there, and they'll never even get through the open because the movements aren't there. Right. So um, we'll take one more question, and I'm not even going to answer it, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. An overview of the number of cycles between now and the open and the intended emphasis of each would be interesting. It would be interesting, and we spend all day thinking about it. So keep following the blog, and you'll probably figure it out. But yep. give away the our thoughts is, come on. Um, you can hear more about how our cycles work at CrossFit Little Rock, August 21st to 23rd, <laughs> or at CrossFit XY in Gerga- <laughs> Reykjavik, Iceland, 918 to 920. Sorry, Arnie. I just, we can't do it. We're trying. I listened to the YouTube video like a hundred times and it's, something's different about it. It's, it's, it's not English. It's Icelandic. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, there's even letters in it that I've never seen. They have dots. There's a D. There's, there's a D. Kind of a D with like a cross through it. Huh. I saw a person that is obviously Asian texting. Well, they are Asian. They're texting at the airport, and I've never seen text messaging like that before. There's nine keys, and they smash them super fast, and it makes symbols in their text message thing. I was like, wow. That's way I mean, how, don't they have like a million characters or something? Yes. How, how would you put that on a cell phone? I don't know. So they just smash all these keys. They got and it all memorized. Like characters just fly up on the screen. It's crazy. Blow, blew my mind. All right. Uh, so that's it. Um, follow our Instagram page. Like, like us it. on Facebook. Uh, what else? Like, oh, subscribe on YouTube. You're already probably subscribing if you're watching. If you haven't, then just do it now. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.